Can we start? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Getting a Foothold in, uh, in Russia panel. Um, we have uh, a very distinguished panel for you today because we have, for the first time in at least five years that I've been part of the, the Russia panel at the Global Institute, an all expat uh, panel. Um, true warriors of doing business in Russia. You know, I think combined, uh, we have, between all of us, we did some calculation over 100 years of living and working in Russia. So we're very pleased to have these, these gentlemen here today. Uh, my name is Alex Kovalar. Um, I've been living in Russia since 1991. Um, I first moved to Russia uh, as the first head of AT&T, first expat sent there at 1991. I spent four years with AT&T and then uh, spent 10 years with RC Co International. Um, 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 I was head of Eastern Europe, uh, opening bottling plants from former Yugoslavia to Central Asia, based out of Moscow. Um, I spent uh, four years at Gallery Media, Russia's second largest uh, outdoor media company. And then for the last few years, I've been busy opening and developing American brands. First, Wendy's. I founded Wendy's. Uh, most recently, uh, Nathan's Famous. And the last one, uh, which I'm in process of launching together with RDIF, is uh, GNC. Um, quick question before we, I introduce the panelists. How many of you have actually been to Russia in the last five years? Those who live there, please put your hands down. <laughs> <laughs> um, friends and family. Yeah, <laughs> friends and family. Well. Probably half. <laughs> but, uh, um, so we have a lot of work to do to win hearts of minds of our audience. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that said, let me introduce um, our panelists. Um, from my right to left, um, on the right is Sean Glodek from the Russian Direct Investment Fund. Uh, Russia's um, response to... Uh, inviting more and more business, and, and an outstanding institution that's, that's really changed the way business is done in Russia. We have um, Steve Hellman from Credit Suisse, you know, a veteran banker who's been around for many, many years. Um, Paul Heth, uh, a pioneer of the Russian cinema, uh, you know, a, a legend. And for all of us who, who didn't have anywhere to go in the early 90s to, to see a movie in English. And um, Mark Stiles, Another pioneer of the Russian real estate market uh, who's been very successful, and I look forward to them sharing their stories with us. Um, and if I may, maybe I could start with you, Paul. Um, you know, last week Bloomberg ran a very nice article on you, which, which is a very good timing for us. Um, they really talked about your story, about how you started your business in Moscow with $600, and, and here you are, you know, years later running a $100 million business. So maybe you could share your, your story with us and, uh, and, and take us from there. Okay. Uh, can we start with slide 57? If that goes up. So uh, I came to Russia in 1993. I was an Army officer and finished my service after Desert Storm and uh, went to Russia really on a kind of a social visit. And after a couple of weeks, I saw there was no movie theaters. And a friend, and a friend of mine and I, we started the first single screen cinema with modern sound and Western movies. And uh, that was very successful. It led to me getting an investment from Eastman Kodak in 1996. And we opened a kind of a large, supersized cinema right in the main square of Moscow called Pushkin Square. That cinema was the highest, one of the highest grossing cinemas, uh, the highest grossing single screen ever in the world, but grossed the equivalent of a multiplex, let's say in downtown London or downtown uh, various parts of the United States. And I said, hey, I probably got something here. Little did I know that I was in for a very interesting uh, life experience and business experience. Um, from that, I, uh, we basically had a problem in 1998 when, when Russia had a tremendous economic uh, default. Most of you might know of that. And I wasn't able to raise money from banks or from any institutions, or there really wasn't an appetite for Russian investments. And I was very lucky to meet the Redstone family. And they said, hey, we like Russia. I don't know. It's too early, kind of stuff I hear now. And uh, why don't we try to do something in the United States, and let's see how well you do, and then we'll think about Russia later. Slide 58, if we could get slide 58. <laughs> and we started in America, which is kind of more common now, but some of the first luxury cinemas in the, in the market. And at the same time, I would basically export my salary to keep an office open in Moscow. And 
as we were building that business, I started building the steps, what I thought would be the first kind of modern multiplex business in Russia. And, and thank goodness Mr. Redstone and Ms. Redstone agreed with me. And in around 2000, slide 59, we opened uh, what was really a, a tremendous success for us, what we call Kino Star. And we basically, actually Mark was involved, we, we, I signed about 60 or $70 million on leases with my credit card uh, with IKEA. And, uh, but th thank goodness the Redstones came to the rescue and helped me finance the lease obligations. And we basically ran that business for up until 2010. Um, really, we had the highest, uh, some of the highest metrics in the, in the cinema industry worldwide. We sold twice as much Coke as the next guy. And I'm talking about worldwide. We, what's, what's the average price ticket on a movie, in a movie theater today? Uh, in, in, today it's around $11. $11. Back then in this period it was about 8 to $10. So this business, we got up to about 9 million customers with six locations. So they're all super high volume, super dense. And we sold this business for, which I think is still a record, uh, multiple of EBITDA per screen to a Russian uh, institutional group last summer. Uh, which leads to the kind of the next uh, slide 60, um, which leads to kind of where I'm now. We, this past December, with help from Sean's uh, organization and some private equity folks, we, we basically a couple hundred million dollar private equity ticket, which for me was very interesting because I remember trying to get a couple thousand dollars in the early 90s. But we bought uh, what was my former largest competitor, a group called Caro. So now when I started in 1993, the box office of Russia, if we can go to slide 53, please. And I go back so far, it's not listed on there. The box office is about $3 million. This year, it'll be approximately $1.5 billion. Um, and I have a company now of about 3,000 employees, and we're basically located through many of the major cities of Russia. Um, the reason why I was, I was excited to come here today, and I feel that it's very important for a lot of people in the private equity and capital markets to understand how promising Russia is, and I know headlines is one way we look at Russia. Uh, my experience has been another one. But um, again, if you could look at slide 54, please. If you could see just uh, you know, prior to the market reforms, people in Russia used to go to the movies 15 times a year. And you could see if on the slide on the left there how, my, how much they don't go to the movies now. So what I'm saying is there's a large upside. And I think in every consumer area, we have the same experience. And Russian consumers are very appreciative, are very sophisticated. They have a tremendous uh, appetite for, for what I'll call uh, consumer brands and goods. If I was sitting here with the man who runs Coca-Cola for Russia or ConAgra or many, many companies, these gentlemen, everyone would be telling the same story. And I think that it's um, interesting that perhaps with the exception of some local private equity firms, a lot of private equity hasn't looked at Russia in the way they should. And so if I can be helpful to kind of tell the story of how, uh, what an interesting opportunity for Russia is, I'd be very welcome to do how, so. How big is the Russian market now? Uh, well, worldwide? for cinema, it's a top 10 market. I see a, a gentleman here from Fox, but depending on the U.S. studio, it's between five and seven. For, and, and what's the potential? I mean, what's, what's, what, what can, where can they really go? I think in the next four or five years, will be about $2.1 billion in ticket sales. And what's interesting about Russia is that many people talk about China uh, in Russia, there's no censorship. We've, we've never had a film censored. Um, with the exception, I'll say one film, Borat, um, which <laughs> <laughs> well, we were highly encouraged to play it, play it after 9 o'clock. So um, I guess there was some issue about a small country in, in Kazakhstan. So anyway, but and also the, the, there, the government doesn't distribute the film, so the, the funds are moved freely between our studio partners and the cinema partners and so on. And I, I just think that, that uh, I think in my career we'll, be, we'll be end up around the top four or five markets. Another interesting fact about Russia, it, for our, again, I can only talk about my business. I'm, I'm not an expert in politics or anything. But for cinema, we, we did a lot of things that are just starting here. For example, we opened movies on Thursday. Uh, Russia is the biggest 3D market in the world uh, in terms of per capita uh, admissions, which is very exciting for our friends at IMAX and Real D. It's uh, the volume for Coca-Cola sales, the volume for popcorn. So if we go through each of the metrics, you can see why that I'm like, hey, let's do it again. And so um, we, we look forward to building a real powerhouse with Carol. And I look forward to seeing you guys in four or five years as a top four market. Excellent. So, so Excellent. So I mean, 
it's I mean, we really appreciate hearing these stories because you know I mean I remember living in Moscow at that time and and, and lining up you know to see third-rate movies in English you know and being very grateful that those movies were available because you know that was so revolutionary at that time when you couldn't make an international phone call but you could actually see a movie in English. Um, Mark, um, you know, maybe you could share a very similar story, I mean, but in a very different field, but also with the same success. I mean, I think it'd be great to hear. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I, uh, I first came to Russia in, in 1993 for, for a party, actually. So. <laughs> a lot of people go there yeah. for that now, a lot more. <laughs> uh, I went there to visit a friend of mine who was working for the first Russian-American real estate joint venture called Perestroika. And he'd been there for two years since 1991 and was getting ready to leave. And he said, if you want to see this, uh, this country while I'm here, come on over. So I did. And I spent uh, about 10 days there. It was really quite eye-opening. I had uh, a reasonable amount of experience in commercial real estate in Atlanta, Georgia. And, and uh, I could see very clearly that the, the opportunity in Russia was, was really big. You have a very large uh, population time is around 145 million people, well-educated, uh, natural resources on the periodic table, every element is, uh, is actually represented in Russia. I think it's the only country in the world has that uh, claim. And a huge amount of uh, functional obsolescence in the market, uh, a lack of uh, any type of platform for offices, for retail, for industrial distribution centers. And then we can see a, a, a very significant demand from uh, international companies to come and participate in that market. So I uh, went back to, uh, to Atlanta, called the leading professor on Russian studies at Georgia State, and ended up taking a, a course on the political and economic transition. All my friends thought I was crazy because I was missing Monday night football. Uh, but uh, I wrote the paper and decided to go for six months and really test my theory, see what happens. So I moved there in 1994 and uh, met a great, great partner, great life uh, friend, uh, Sergey Rybokovilka. We started uh, representing companies like Booz Allen Hamilton, Price Waterhouse, McDonald's, Nestle, Boeing, the list goes on and on, and helping them to find basic solutions for office space and uh, distribution centers, uh, acquiring factories. Uh, McDonald's was a, a very significant first client of ours. At the time it was about $5,000 to connect a mobile telephone. And uh, they actually... Well, what was the average price of uh, square footage back then versus, you know, later obviously where, where it wound up? I well, mean. prices have, have moved up and, up and down the scale, but uh, it was still expensive at the time. And we were looking at rents in the kind of $500 uh, uh, a square meter price range. and. Um, which was very good from a commission standpoint because these fees were uh, significantly larger than what we were able to make in, in other markets uh, like the United States. But um, you know, building these relationships one, one deal at a time and being very pragmatic, helping, uh, helping the McDonald's uh, create real estate on sites where the highest and best use wasn't just to have one particular restaurant but to actually put office space on top of it. So we were uh, making buildings and leasing them out to companies like uh, Boeing and American Express and Can Erickson, all the uh, organizations that needed a, a strong place. And it turned out to be very positive for McDonald's uh, in 98 when the crisis came because they had hard currency uh, rents coming in and they only had a small number of restaurants at the time. Now they have, I think, 350, 350 restaurants. And the, um, the fast serve uh, restaurant uh, business in, in Russia is growing tremendously. I think Nathan's going to be a, oh, a very, very good success absolutely. there. Absolutely. Burger King's entered the market, Subway. And um, the real story, I think, in Russia is about the, the growth of the uh, middle class and the Russian consumer. Um, and the fundamentals in Russia are quite a bit quite a bit different than what we're accustomed to in, the, in Western societies where we have mortgages and we have uh, credit card debt and uh, automobile loans and insurance payments, etc. Russia, uh, Russian population has a very, very low level of, uh, of debt. In fact, the Russian government gave a lot of uh, the citizens their apartments after the, after the wall came down. 
and they kept the commercial assets and started making joint venture contracts with developers and capital sources at the time. So it really fueled the, uh, the growth of the middle class and the, and the retail market. And I think that is where we see a, a lot of uh, very strong opportunity going forward in Russia. So uh, in 1998, I made an association with a global company called Cushman and Wakefield. And uh, that gave them an opportunity to have a, a dot on a map in, in Russia, some representation there. We were serving a lot of their clients that they uh, serviced around the globe. And it gave us an international brand name company that we had was called Styles and Rybuk. How big were you at, at that time? I mean, in we were about uh, 37 people. Yeah, and in, and in revenue, I mean, I mean, in revenue, it was uh, it was not really significant. <coughs> but uh, once we we hit the the uh, 1998 uh, crisis, and uh, one thing that was very positive is that we were able to to maintain all of our employees. We ran a very uh, tight operation, um, and we actually grew our business uh, through that period of time. And in 1999, we were awarded the Small Business uh, of the Year Award by the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Nestle received the uh, Large Business of the Year Award. We actually helped them acquire a number of factories throughout the market. So even in the downturns, the uh, astute operators there were actually uh, making very, very strong investments, and uh, which later led to very profitable businesses and uh, great buying opportunities. And in 2005, we made an agreement with Cushman and Wakefield to, to buy our company, which they did. So I retired my treasury and uh, started working with a, uh, a little bit stronger global resources. I recruited people from New York, from Chicago, from London, um, some from France, uh, to kind of shore up our activities. At the time, we were about 100 people. And we grew to about 350 people over a four-year period. And we went from about $7 million in, in revenue at that time to about $45 million in revenue, uh, which is about six times, six times growth at, the, at that point. In 2009, we re restructured the business. Uh, fortunately for me, my earnout ended in 2008. And uh, I put in a new management team. My partner actually took over as the general director, managing partner for the, for the organization. And uh, I was looking for something else to do in the, in the real estate sphere. And I partnered with a gentleman named Ruben Vardanyan, who's been a speaker here before. He founded Troika uh, Dialogue Investment Bank, which he sold to Spare Bank. And um, so today the portfolio is about $1.2 billion of commercial real estate assets in Moscow and uh, a very strong cash flow. And we're embarking on the, the next step to basically institutionalize this, uh, this business and invite in global capital from sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and endowments and other high net worth individuals. So those are pretty, you know, remarkable success stories, you know, starting, you know, with $600 or starting, you know, with nothing and building into, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, it's very impressive. And these are not unusual stories, you know, and uh, I think we don't hear enough of these stories. Um, you know, Russia has not done a job, a, a great job selling uh, those stories. Uh, the PR element just has not been there. And I think we'll, we'll talk with Sean about that as representative of the government. But maybe we can move on to, to, uh, to Steve. Tell us about you know what what your uh, institutional investors and your clients how do they perceive Russia their risks and rewards and what makes them sure well they certainly perceive risks but let's let's talk about what they like about Russia if you turn to slide 16 um, what they see is slide 16 please that's good thank you Mark. you know they see a, an economy that has uh, well it's a, a country of 150 million people so the largest in Europe um, very low debt as a percentage of GDP. Um, Public and private debt together is roughly a third. Uh, and you compare that to you know, the US or a company like Japan, which is over 200%. Public debt, that is government debt, is, is less than 10%. So remarkably low rate. And I think that was very important uh, for, the, uh, for the country, particularly when we were going through the crisis in 2008. So it is, uh, I think the uh, investors see the country as very well insulated from, uh, from future shocks as a result. Um, and it's a very large economy. By 2020, 
Um, it's projected to be uh, the largest economy in Europe, even bigger than, than Germany. So the, the future growth is, is, is really extraordinary, and investors perceive that. If you turn to slide 17, you can see that um, you know, investors see a very vibrant and growing consumer sector. They see very high GDP per capita, almost approaching $20,000 per, per person, high disposable rates of income, uh, and, and high, high growth in, 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 in per capita uh, consumption. And then on the last page, um, you can see they really like the consumer sector and the retail sector. They see it's underpenetrated and they see tremendous opportunities for growth. If you look at the slide at the, on the left, uh, hypermarkets are a good indication of the opportunity for, for greater penetration in the sector. And if you look just at general retail, you know, projecting 17 percent growth um, on a per Kager, you know, over the next five years. Really, there's no other market uh, outside of the BRICS, <clears throat> certainly in developed markets, where there's that growth potential. So, you know, when investors look at the Russian market, I think what they're, see they're seeing a country that's very similar, certainly European and American investors, they're seeing a country that's very similar to their own, but at a stage of development uh, where the U.S. and Western Europe were 20, 30 years ago. And so all they need to do is project forward, and they see tremendous tremendous opportunity. And what are the things that they dislike? Well, you know, Russia is not dissimilar from other emerging markets like China, India, uh, Brazil. You know, there is certainly con corruption. We can't look beyond that. Um, uh, there are issues with corporate governance. Uh, there is an absence of, of stable institutions, whether it's, a, you know, a strong two-party system of governance, uh, independent judiciary, uh, and obviously, you know, certain mass media is, is, is government uh, dominated. So that gives investors pause. Um, and I think uh, another big issue is the lack of the diversification of the economy. You know, 50% of government revenues to date come from the oil and gas sector. And that balance needs to be addressed. But in fact, that's an opportunity for the country. And I think that's where RDIF really comes in. And, and Sean uh, can comment on that. Um, because, you know, you know with, with a $10 billion fund, and I th you know, maybe you could talk about you know, how, how the first investments were made, you know, which were not obviously made in, in strategic reserves or made in other areas of... of of, of the economy. Sure, Alex. I mean, the $10 billion private equity fund set up by the Russian government a little under two years ago was really meant to address a lot of issues um, that um, um, Steve just talked about. Uh, I think what you, what you just saw here is a number of you know, quite success entrepreneurship stories, and they're really dime a dozen. There's a lot of them. Uh, what you don't have in Russia, um, and given how the markets develop, how big it is, and how much bigger it's going to get, is an institutional investor market. And, and that's somewhere where uh, the Russian government stepped back and said, well, gee, how do we, um, how do we address this void? Because you have, uh, on a percentage basis, the private equity market is almost close to zero. Whereas if you look at even other emerging economies, even you look at China, all, all the breaks, it's much higher. Uh, and um, I think a comment you made that uh, Russia is still a developing market, and in a way it has certain challenges that developing markets do. And they're not really different than what you have in, in, in other BRICS. At the same time, uh, when you look at percentage basis of institutional investors' penetration in Russia, it's really zero. Uh, whereas you have substantial investor penetration in, in, in Brazil, in China, and to a lesser extent in India. Uh, so the Russian gov government really started to think, how do we do, um, how do we set up uh, a vehicle uh, that is uh, not a, another government agency, that is not a special economic zone that people just, uh, not a tax benefit, somewhere where uh, you can really have a, a local partner for investors uh, to be able to access and provide government um, uh, certainty uh, 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 without necessarily a government burden. But I think, but I think RDIF... Um, differentiate itself. So, I mean, it's so different from other attempts that the government has made in the past. I mean, having worked with, I mean, RDIF, I could tell you that the quality of the staff, you know, Harvard, Stanford, I mean, you know, Western education, I mean, it, it, amazing. I mean, having worked on a GNC transaction together, I mean, I mean, the level of professionalism is unprecedented. I mean, frankly, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great compliment to what they've been able to do in such a short time. Well, thank you, Alex. I think what, uh, what I'd like to do is point to a slide number 36, if I may. Um, uh, when uh, two years ago, when uh, government uh, embarked on uh, formation of the fund, uh, it really set out to uh, uh, get uh, the who is who the best of the global set of investors, institutional investors, both on the GP side, on um, an, an LP side, and sovereign wealth fund side. Uh, and these people uh, personally 
um, uh, joined the advisory board of RDIF. Uh, they met with the president, and they, they answered simple questions. The president said, how come you guys are not investing in Russia? You're investing everywhere else. Um, and the response was uniform. You've got to help us to um, uh, de-risk, uh, not an economic risk, because there everybody is uh, prepared to take, but to de-risk real and imaginary uh, risk of doing business in Russia. Um, and out of that consultation came out this fund. That's a pure private equity fund, $10 billion. It's set up as a co-investment fund, so it can only invest up to 50% of a transaction, which means that the foreign investor, uh, including a lot of these gentlemen here and their funds that we're working with right now, uh, would lead transactions, but would have a government as a pari passu partner um, uh, on the ground, uh, invest having exactly the same incentives as the investors coming into Russia. Uh, if I could flip then to page 35, uh, in setting up the uh, fund to be really the uh, true access uh, to the government. Uh, the supervisory board uh, has been established where you have really the uh, senior heads of the presidential administration, the future head of the central bank. Uh, you have uh, two sitting ministers. Uh, you have also two foreigners. One is someone you, some of you may know is Josh Lerner, professor at Harvard Business School, who's also instrumental, or continues to be instrumental in how we set up and how we run the fund and how we train our employees. Um, and Laurent Vigier, who's the head of Casa de Pau, the uh, international business, the sovereign wealth fund of France. Um, and we also have a rule that on any committee of the board, you have at least one foreigner. So when you look at this, you really have to uh, be comfortable uh, that um, uh, the government is very serious about putting something in place that does answer institutional investors coming to, uh, uh, to Russia. I would only point out, uh, if I can go to slide um, uh, 33. Uh, one of the examples of how we work with uh, institutional investors is we set up an uh, automatic co-investment fund with Kuwaiti Investment Authority. Uh, Kuwaitis uh, have uh, allocated $500 million, which is the largest check they've ever written, uh, to uh, basically have 5% of everything that uh, RDIF does. And that's a model of uh, fund setup. If you go to page 34, uh, we set up another vehicle with CIC, with the China Investment Corporation, which is the largest probably LP globally. Um, uh, to uh, contribute uh, one billion each into a joint venture, uh, which is a now uh, closed fund uh, to invest in businesses that do business between Russia and China. Um, and we're now in the process of fundraising the other two billion dollars. Uh, we have also since then announced cooperation with uh, both Casa de Pol uh, to uh, set up a two billion dollar fund to work with French companies investing in Russia. Uh, we just announced when the Prime Minister was um, uh, in Moscow a couple of days ago a $2 billion fund with JBIC, which is J Japanese Investment uh, Development Bank, uh, to help uh, finance um, the Japanese companies investing in Russia and Japanese technologies being uh, uh, deployed in Russia. Uh, we have, uh, we're working on a similar fund with one of the large Middle, East Middle Eastern countries. So I think uh, the fund was really set up to help the institutional investors come in, but at its heart it's a direct uh, co-investment fund so it invests like in the business uh, that Paul runs and invests in the business that Alex runs uh, but fundamentally our job is to bring foreign investors and give them comfort so that's I would just want to say that this is a real game changer uh, but, but it, you know I mean from my perspective on the ground I could tell you that RDF has been revolutionary I mean it really has and I think unfortunately a lot of that doesn't get um, out as much as it should because you know when you know when you talk about Russia you know outside of Russia you want you know, people I start asking about Pussy Riot, about Magnitsky, about, uh, about adoptions, you know, they want to talk about, you know, sort of these black eyes on the PR of Russia. And, you know, and the question is why hasn't Russia done a better job um, combating sort of the bad PR? Because these things are so minor, you would think, you know, seem, but they seem to black out these fantastic achievements and uh, they've been done. And it's, I guess it's a question both, you know, for Steve and for you, you know, what can Russia do to improve its image, you know? To, well, to, I, I to, to get rid of the perceived arrogance you know, when it comes to the Steve PR. Steve put it best. It is a it is a developing more country, and it will have challenges. Uh, you have the court system that it's being approved, <coughs> frankly, every year, uh, but it still has some uh, issues here and there. Uh, you have a regulatory system that um, is again improved every year, uh, but it still sometimes produces something that's not perfect. I don't think that's really unique to Russia. Uh, I don't think it's unique even to emerging markets. Do we have situations like that? I think for some reason when you just read Financial Times and Economist, mm -hmm. the share of print that gets allocated to, to bad news coming out of Russia is, is much more substantial. So in, in a way we're being held to a higher standard, uh, which, is, which is fine. And I think uh, the, the, 
rather than to market a lot, uh, what's behind uh, RDIF, for example, is really do one relationship at a time, one success story at a time, but on a larger scale. Because if we can convince, what well, we've seen and we have seen, that you can build a successful business in Russia, you can build it again and again and again. Russia does not have any currency control, so there's absolutely no issues that you could build your business and somehow you cannot get the money out. You can, that, that, that there's no currency controls, even in the midst of the crisis of 98. Um, but what you really need is successful case studies of senior institutions, large global institutions coming to Russia and being successful, and that's really what we're doing. It's just one, one relationship at a time, because that will speak for itself. Yeah, Alex, I think if we can go to slide 44, can give an example of uh, this um, perceived risk today that's in the market. As we're seeing uh, in the real estate sector, the, the uh, spread between the yields in Central and Eastern Europe and Europe and Russia. And I call this uh, this kind of perceived risk. It's uh, almost like a free return. You've got international credit tenants occupying buildings that are uh, have registered leases and uh, high quality uh, assets that are sitting in Russia and uh, the same tenants that you would have in Europe and we're getting another 400 basis points uh, over what those same assets would have anywhere else in the market. So I, I theorize that probably 200, at least 200 basis points of that is just free return or 20 percent of the return that we're getting in the commercial real estate business today is a free return in Russia. Um, and I think if you look at the companies that are operating there, the global uh, fast-moving consumer goods companies and, and others, uh, if you dig down into their profit uh, statements, their most profitable businesses uh, are not in China, India, or Brazil, but actually in Russia. In Russia. Mm -hmm. right. For our industry, an interesting metric is, uh, this is the second company I've had where we, our revenues average about a million around a million to a million one per screen. If you took the top U.S. large cap cinema companies, it's three to five hundred thousand. So I just give you an idea of the difference of, of the, uh, the asset This is very, because it really comes across a lot of sectors. I mean, from real estate to, to cinema, even, you know, in, in fast food. Um, if, if I can go to slide 22, please. Um, if you look at the, the number of um, the, the QSR penetration, can I get slide 22? Slide 22, please. Oh, thank you. Um, as you can see, you know, for instance, you know, when we look at this uh, opportunity, you know, um, you know, we are, you know, eight nine times behind, you know, North North America, you know. So, you know, our goal is to open and penetrate and, and get more fast food uh, locations as much as possible because we're we're so far behind. Can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, I think this is a very telling number, and this, this is always kind of an eye opener. Um, if you look at the and it's, it's too bad that Jim Ganslinger is not here from Subway. He's usually attending um, these uh, sessions, but he, he's, he's, he's out of the country. But we, all, we had a very nice discussion with him on, uh, la, la, last year on the same panel. Um, you, you could just see that, you know, there's just such a huge opportunity um, because most of the numbers you see for, for the Russian sale, points of sale, are all in Moscow and St. Petersburg. I mean, the regions are still untapped. And, and if you look at the number of locations for, for Subway, for, for McDonald's, for, for KFC, for, for Burger King, it's just staggering. And uh, there's such a huge interest in the sector. I mean, Burger King, after opening 50 locations, got a valuation for VTB of $100 million. So, I mean, the, the upside is tr still, tr uh, still tremendous. Yeah. And one more slide, please, the next one. Um, I think that also gives you, um, you know, to the same point that Paul mentioned, uh, when you compare U.S average ticket versus, you know, Russia, the average ticket uh, um, per transaction is significantly higher in Russia. So, you know, people are, are paying premium to, to get the same fast food and, and, uh, and that's an enormous potential um, down the road. Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, a very interesting proposition to see how to support what I like to call the, uh, the growth of the the Russian consumer infrastructure in Russia. And it goes back to the slide that Steve put up earlier, the lack of penetration in the market for the big box uh, food retailers and, and home improvement uh, retailers. And this, uh, this opportunity today, I think if we go to slide 45, you can see the, the underpenetration of the, of the market per capita in, in Russia compared to other uh, countries. 
based on retail space per capita and office space per capita. So what, uh, what we see as one of the, the very unique opportunities today is to help make this market penetration uh, a reality. Many of the Russian uh, and national and international retailers that are operating in the big box sector today have had to develop using their own balance sheet because the developers weren't prepared to build that type of an asset for them specifically. And uh, our position now going forward is to become the, their partner, their takeout partner, and help them free up cash from uh, that's locked in real estate today and reinvest it into the expansion of the business to, to meet the demand of the, the growing uh, Russian middle class. Excellent. I think we have about five minutes left, so if, um, we'd love to hear some questions from you. I appreciate this talk a lot. I spent about a week in uh, Moscow not too long ago, and uh, I agree there, there's a lot of opportunity. And I forget who mentioned it, there's also a lot of difficulty in um, navigating the market. There's no PR, if you would, mm -hmm. on, on how to get around and navigate the politics and the ins and outs. And um, I hope one of you might be able to reach out to me after the talk and let me know how I can do business there, because I want to. What is, what is your business? Yeah. I'm in the luxury and exotic car rental business. All right, you're in the right city, in the right country. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you seen the potholes? I'm not sure. You... <laughs> sure. Yes, please. Yes, of course. Please. Of course. Uh, how is the development of infrastructure there? I was in Moscow uh, a year ago, and it took me about an hour and 45 minutes to get out to the airport. Um, it didn't seem that there were really adequate uh, highways. Uh, and that the population had vastly exceeded the infrastructure, at least in Moscow. Um, and how do you see that as a possible constraint on growth, and how is it well, being addressed? That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's an excellent question. question. Uh, it's a question for, for Sean. I mean, especially with the Olympics coming, with the World Cup coming, how do you deal with infrastructure and, and, and what's being done to facilitate that? Sure. I think, I think on that very specific question, um, uh, in Moscow, you have, uh, from the center of Moscow, you can go take a train, and it's uh, 35 minutes to get you to any of the three airports. So <laughs> that's, that's part of, you know, that's, pa that's part of uh, <laughs> traffic. Traffic is indeed bad. I don't think it's worse than in a lot of the large cities. I mean, Moscow itself, daytime population is probably 15 or more. It's not worth worse no. than Rio or uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean it's not bad. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as traffic itself, um, if we are actually, as part of our DIF, working right now with uh, some large inst international investors looking into Russia on infrastructure to put uh, uh, toll roads, uh, uh, bridges, airports and ports, uh, develop the green de development projects into a fund that we're uh, going to structure according to the you know, P3 um, uh, practices uh, with a certain amount of guarantees, uh, proper long-term financing uh, from state banks, but with a substantial sliver for equity that would receive uh, an adequate market return, which would be probably around mid-teens in dollars um, uh, based on availability payment. So, uh, infrastructure itself, there's a lot of spending. If you go to Moscow, if you go to St. Petersburg, any of the regional cities, there's 13 cities with at least a million dollar population in Russia, you'll see a lot of construction. In a way, what these are the gentlemen talked about, the uh, tripling of middle class in the last five years. Uh, those trends are faster than what you can build in infrastructure. Um, so you see a lot of improvement, uh, but in a way you still have fundamental growth in the market that really outpaces the ability to, uh, uh, to, to develop. Moscow wasn't built to have so many cars. I mean, everybody has cars now, so I mean, unfortunately that's, that remains a, a big problem. No, I think there's about 10 million people inside the equivalent of uh, the ring road around Atlanta, Georgia. And it's, uh, it's highly congested. But there's 9 million riders a day on the metro system. Exactly. And as fast as the new roads are being built, because the, the old ring road all the way around the city was uh, a two-lane highway when I first came there with no lights. And now it's a multi-lane, uh, limited access uh, road. But as fast as new roads are built, it's people are buying cars. more cars. I think it's one of the top car sales markets actually in, in Europe now. Yeah, Inchcape paid. Outside of Los Angeles. Yeah. I think Inchcape paid, you know, I don't know how many billions for, for Musa Motors, one of the Russian, uh, Russian car dealers. I mean, mm -hmm. staggering amount of money. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Jean-Pierre, I'll just go back to, to your question that you asked a little bit earlier. I think that um, historic historically we've seen that uh, having the right partners anywhere you go is uh, is important, and I think in, in Russia, for me, that was a, that was a very 
valid point, is to have someone who understood the landscape there that spoke Russian, um, even though he wasn't necessarily expert on uh, real estate at the time. I was speaking of my partner, Sergey, grew into that. And really playing the game on the, on the level that you're used to playing it in a, on an international basis and sticking, sticking to those principles. I find that that's where all of the most successful businesses that I've worked with and, and my own uh, have, uh, have benefited the most from having, having good local partners. The last question. I would say that to attract institutional investors, that it would be good to have proxy statements where you can actually tell who are the owners of the company. I would also say that I can tell the owner of our company yeah. if you like. <laughs> no problem. I would also say that in terms of the regulatory um, environment, if you publish, um, for example, electricity rates and give forecasts for the for the deregulation, that they actually be held to. Very interesting. Those are fair points, and you know the, the Securities Administration is actually addressing this concern about beneficial ownership. I know that because we're a broker dealer, and they they've made it very clear to us that we're going to have to be prepared to uh, you know provide the beneficial ownership of of of, of, of individuals and, and institutions that transact through us. So they are addressing that concern. And with regard to the liberalization of the power sector, you know obviously that's a very political or politicized sector. It is not a country where you want the heat to go off in the winter. So, uh, you know, it has been a very sensitive issue over for more than a decade. And so I think the government needs to have a bit of slack in regards to that liberalization process. It's going to take some time. There's a, There's question. a question behind. Hi. Um, I thought I'd just make, make a comment. I, I've been going to Russia since 1989. I'm as cynical as anybody about all its flaws. But it's also worth noting that there is a second economy in Russia, which is the, the online internet economy that is transparent, consumer driven, people expect to be able to find out prices, uh, it's modern, and it, it's small, it doesn't overcome oil and gas and government and everything else. But if you want to do business in Russia, there are, there is a sector that is it's the largest internet economy in Europe. It's growing, and it's it's an amazing thing that the Russians treasure, and it's it's made a huge difference politically as well because people who are on Kontaktia and on Facebook who have an identity that persists, they can't be disappeared like their uncle Ivan. They feel empowered. They ask questions of merchants. They ask questions of authority and they're beginning to wonder why if they can pick their movies and their clothes they can't pick their government and it's it's very hard to predict what's going to happen but th there is another side to this economy that's worth noting for everybody in the room who you know it's I no, love but Russia thank you for saying it. it's, so a, many it's absolutely true it's yeah. in, in one side note on internet I mean uh, there was a story just a couple of weeks ago uh, about how the airport just shut down delivery uh, of packages because uh, people were buying uh, so much from uh, from U.S. on eBay on Amazon because you get the thirty-three dollars. You know you don't pay tax on the first. Oh, it's thirty-three dollars, I think. There's so much packages were sent to Russia. The airport was shut down for for a week. They said we're not taking accepting any more packages. That's it because people were just ordering so much. You know from from U.S. It's amazing. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, I, th I think they, they announced are. that they are. They are. Yeah. Yeah. They are. Yeah. What would you guys say is the kind of current sentiment of your average middle class Russian citizen? Um, I mean, are they do they want to stay in Russia? Are they looking to to you know get upward mobility and move to Europe or the U.S. Because obviously that has a long term effect on kind of all the business lines that you guys are in. So I just wanted to get your sense on, on yeah, that. I, I think, oh, go ahead. Please. Go ahead, no, please. I'd Hold say it. from a personal standpoint, you know, I've been there 20 years. And it's interesting. Uh, many people have worked for us. They're almost like family. They are family to us for 20 years. So take my, uh, my former secretary, who's now a vice president. But she started, uh, she was a, a, a journalism student. She, she went through kind of working for, with us for a few years. 
she took out a mortgage, she bought a house, then she bought a dacha, and then she had children. I mean, I, I see that, she, like for example, we have a trade show in Las Vegas every year, and every year she used to ask me, oh, I gotta go to Las Vegas, I get out of here. Last two years she hasn't asked. She, she's, I mean, the point is I've seen more confidence of, of that sector of the market, or if we could call it the, that portion of the middle class uh, wanting to She's do more really and stay in Russia. But I I'm still think that time. people believe it's not for, for day by day, like is, is this going to be a good thing tomorrow? And I think that's where more of um, kind of political issues in, in talking about it, uh, like, like Esther just said, that I think you see more of that honest discussion on the internet than you would like, in the ca like directly in the office. So I, I have to say the internet part has been a big part of people expressing their frustrations and so on, so. Well, I would only add that, uh, you know, we've been less than two years, we grew a company from zero to 100 professionals, and most of the professionals are what we refer to inpats, which are Russians that uh, left back. Russia, went to school in the U.S. or U.K. or wherever, you know, in mm -hmm. Germany or France, spent some time in bulge bracket institutions, and now coming back because they get more exposure, a lot, of um, a lot more opportunity. Uh, and again, it's not for everybody. There's still, you know, you, you pass by the embassy, there's a long line of people as, mm -hmm. as is any other emerging market. Uh, but uh, what's, what's encouraging that we're able to actually attract and retain young people coming back with the right experience and skills. Speaking of the internet, I'm, I'm an investor and in, uh, sit on the board of uh, an internet company called Astravok, which is the leading uh, hotel uh, company uh, in Russia online. And we've hired over 200 people. And you go into the office and you think you're in Palo Alto. And it's extraordinary, an office, vibrant office filled with 20-something tech, tech, technologically literate uh, young people, you know, building a, a, a world-class internet company. And they, there's no place else they'd rather be because the opportunity is so vast and so untapped. Telling an anecdote, I was, I was trying to explain what, what it was like so a couple of weeks after one of the large demonstrations against the election fraud, I went online to Twitter and I looked for the word meeting, spelled in Cyrillic, which is the Russian word for a meeting as in a demonstration. Mm -hmm. And I found the following tweet, I, I'll translate, but she said, to, this was the night before the demo, she said, her name was Snyajana, which is something like Snowbell or something. Mm -hmm. So she says, tomorrow is a really big day. First I go peeling, as in face peeling, then the meeting, and then shopping. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's part of their lives. Yes, it's the order of priorities. That's why, that's why cars peeling. work. <laughs> peeling and shopping. Um, how do you address for foreign investors the reputation, and maybe it's a headline reputation, not reality, is the, ran the reputation for rampant corruption and for foreign investors somehow it feels that there's a parallel business that the international, that the corruption stays out or is that not true or how do you deal with that and is it not true? Well, I mean, I think at the last Russia forum, um, President Putin got up um, and said that we're going to go from number 240 to, to number 40, the ease of doing business, and, 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 uh, and I think they didn't move to 40. It said in two years, but in one year they moved to about 50 spaces, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, I mean, I think they had, they're making legitimate attempts to try to stem that. I mean, but it's also comical about how um, the people in the Russian parliament are, are now all getting divorces because you know they have to declare their income so they're all d divorcing their wives because a lot of the uh, assets are in their names so i think 40 40 uh, senators have gotten divorced in the last few months <laughs> so <laughs> they're still trying to bypass it so it's a legitimate question but i think it's something that really they are addressing they really are addressing but the, but the best I, cure for that is uh, as a business owner i can tell you now 20 years if business people just say not no but hell no and i can tell for us when people approach us <coughs> we just say we cannot be in a situation to entertain malfeasance, corruption, and so on. And we're ready to, to, to face those consequences. And I find uh, that they understand, when folks understand that, they don't waste your time anymore. Because, and I think if more, and I, I always encourage, uh, and we're a good sized company now, we have you know 3,000 employees and a couple hundred million sales, but I see more of that mindset from business people. Obviously as an American and Western owned, we have to have that mindset. It's in, you know, as this, she talked about uh, proxy. I mean, it's in our DNA. But I think I see more and more Russian businesses 
uh, taken in business owners taking that same particular very well needed stance. I think the gentleman there had a question. Thanks, thanks for some comments and questions. And uh, before I pick up on a question that I wanted to be a bit of a thought provoking, I just wanted to say that I r started a company in Russia, currently operate in Russia and London. And one of the biggest challenges for me is to convince my colleagues to move from Moscow to work in London. It comes out cheaper for me to hire staff in London or to hire people who left eight or 10 years ago. Right now, you have to give a very substantial, uh, first of all, financial reward for a 30, 40 year guy to finish a career in Moscow and move over to London. And this is what has started the immense growth both in China and in India. When you have people, as you refer to them, impacts, going out, training, getting work experience, and then coming back to use the opportunities in the market. And to go to a question part. We all understand what the current uh, fundraising and investment cycle is about. But if to look about 10 years forward, we are in the same room and you're raising money, what will be the industry and the scope in Russia which will be most attractive in 10 years? I think the internet economy. I think technology and the internet economy. I think service, the service economy still is, I mean, we look again, and I'm partial, obviously, to offering a service, but we look at so many things that we take for granted here, like dry cleaners or, uh, you know, concierge, all those different type of things that make your life easier. Of course, they'll be wedded to an internet experience, but I think the service industry has tremendous potential. Well, I would say I think it's the real estate industry as well. <laughs> 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 we still have uh, a lot of a you lot of market. I didn't say investment banking. That's right. A lot of uh, we still have a lot of market to penetrate here and. Um, I have, uh, quite honestly, the same type of feeling I had in the early 90s when I came. It was a, a huge opportunity to set up a, a service industry to support uh, multinationals. Today, there are just a handful of uh, Still. international Still. Yeah. Uh, uh, real estate general <laughs> partners that are operating in Russia and just a handful of national real estate partners, whereas in the West and Europe, there's, uh, there are thousands. So a lot of opportunity. You're going to see a considerable shift away from the natural resource-based economy towards a consumer-driven services business economy. That's where all the opportunity for growth is, and that's where the best and brightest are going to work, sure. because that's where they know they get a transparent, fair deal, which is much less politicized than other parts of the economy. But in, in that the context, it's good to see our DIF is actually it's, as a vehicle it, it, for it that. Is, is supporting that. Sure. And that's I mean, that, the, last, the last two decades, I think, have been trying to figure out what's going on. There was a lot of grabbing of assets. and in trying to position yourself in the next 10 years, there was a lot of development taking place, people figuring out the combination and how to get properties actually executed. And now this, this next decade, we see actually there's enough product in the market that trading can start to take place and uh, you're gonna kind of go in as a value add investor and avoid the, all the opportunity development risks and uh, make, some, make some very significant returns without creating a lot of risk. Yeah, I would, I would add two industries where we recently invested. One is in, it's, it's in healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, we invested a leading, um, uh, let's say, obstetrics um, chain of hospitals and clinics in Russia, uh, growing at 30% a year, 40% EBITDA margins. And there's quite a number of those companies, so it's a really exploding sector. Uh, and that in 10 years, you'll see a private healthcare uh, all the way, not just uh, on, uh, on the, uh, the kind of a day spa, uh, Band-Aid solution, but actually on, on, on the hospital. We're actually working with one company that opened a um, cancer treatment hospital, uh, which is a privately owned, for 100 beds. Um, so I would expect that sector to do very well and grow and be a pretty significant uh, return uh, opportunity for investors over 10 years. The other one that we spent some time on, we in, uh, were investor in Moscow uh, Exchange, which is exchange for stocks, derivatives, as well as bonds. Uh, and um, that you know, exchange is now capitalized north of $4 billion, which puts it one of the leading global exchanges in the world. So we expect the asset management, uh, working on a pension fund reform, um, to be able to invest in stocks and, and bonds on a local exchange. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, working with BlackRock and Franklin Templeton on introducing mutual funds and ETFs to Russia. So you see that the financial sector and, and alternatives to deposits for consumers and institutions, uh, as well as private healthcare, I would see that to drivers for the next 10 years of value. I think the question should be what 
in the industry would you not invest in in 10 years? So it seems like all the industries we, we're pretty excited about. Yeah, I mean, Moscow is the largest city in Europe, and I've, I've found over 20 years in extensive travel throughout the entire country. I mean, Russians are, are more like Americans than anybody I've ever met anywhere else. And my vision for the future is that all of the uh, build out of um, uh, infrastructure and support for having a high quality of life are, are happening in real time right now in Russia. So whichever sector of the market you decide that you're going to become an expert in, if you, if you really invest the time and not just uh, want to fly in and fly out and try and make a quick buck, but uh, are ready to invest with people who have been there for a long time and understand the area of the market, I think there's, there's And I think also returns. with the coming Olympics, I think it's a Russia's opportunity to show a different face to the world. I mean, there, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, World Cup as well. Of WTO course, World Cup. Is just how much there. money is being spent in the Olympics? I mean, it's, it's, it's fifty billion. I mean, you know, it's or, it's it's really or, um, it's President Putin's show, you know, to, to to put a different face on Russia, and there's a lot of pride involved in that. So I mean, th there's a lot of hope that the Olympics will bring uh, a different perspective of the world on Russia. So I mean, it's it's a great PR opportunity for the whole country. One more question. Yeah, one more question. Of the sectors that you've mentioned, um, one that I didn't hear was manufacturing. What's happening in that? What's happening in that area? Steve, <laughs> Steve, you're there. Steve, that's a government. The gov that's a government question. <laughs> it, 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 that's a broad question. I mean, it really it really depends on cars. on on the sectors. Uh, yeah, I mean, cars is just it's, it's <laughs> huge. I think Russia has to do a better job of uh, moving up farther up the value chain in, in manufacturing. Right now, they have. Uh, the luxury of exporting commodities, and they're they're doing that very well, and they're generating large incomes from that. But uh, uh, we're seeing that there are investments in automobiles and in food production and processing. And I mean, again, it's all the way down the line. I mean, people uh, have to recognize that the country as Russia today has has only been operating for what, about 22 years right now. Since and we moved there, that's right, and it's <laughs> and it's and it's been through. Uh, quite a number of cycles, so I would say it's 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 more of a teenager right now and moving into the kind of young adult stage, and it's a multi generational process to to build nations and uh, certainly all nations around the the world that uh, have gone through that time have 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 benefited from it. So I think it's just an eventuality. And I think that's where the RDF plays a role because a lot of the manufacturing sectors are really dependent on the import of world-class technology and, and, and processes and and that's where the RDIF can be the perfect partner for a strategic company whether it's a Mercedes-Benz or a uh, Siemens you know to come in and partner with them and, and establish you know very safely and, and securely uh, you know these uh, these systems and, 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 and make these investments. I mean just on the very point we are uh, working on a, a manufacturing uh, company in um, in industrial light vehicle production uh, and components also. Uh, we're looking at uh, pharmaceuticals and a new production of low-end pharmaceuticals initially. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, uh, food processing. Uh, so the light manufacturing side is somewhere, obviously on a, on a, on a hard, heavy manufacturing side on steel, uh, and then you know, Russia definitely has a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. But on the light manufacturing side, something that we're definitely getting ourselves into. It is more of a strategic bent as opposed to a private equity bent. Uh, at least initially, uh, but it's it's definitely an activity that uh, we're engaged in. I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Uh, Andre, I think Andre. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment on that. You have, you have to recognize that Russia is a respectably high cost labor economy. And unfortunately, in the manufacturing, there is a lot of leftovers from the Soviet era. The unions, the labor industry. Social costs.
find sector which is very sensitive to transportation costs, like you mentioned, for example, food costs, you will do exceptionally well. But you have to keep in mind that this is not a low cost way of doing it. That's a good point. Okay. I think we ran out of time, so thank you so much for your time. <laughs>